empathy is not just good for the world. Being an empathetic leader can actually be a super strong advantage to help you achieve your goals and to attract the right people to work for you. It also is an advantage if you want to be a thought leader and be recognized for having impact and ideas that change the world. Stay tuned. Today, we're going to talk with Denise Purceau, an expert on thought leadership, about the role empathy plays to help you be more successful. Welcome to today's show, where we're going to talk about how empathy can be a leadership advantage. And I'm thrilled to welcome my guest, Denise Brousseau. Denise, welcome to our little show here. Thanks, Maria. It's nice to be here. So for those of you who don't know Denise, she's amazing. She's the CEO of the Thought Leadership Lab, which is based here in Silicon Valley. Um, she works with executives and entrepreneurs that are seeking to increase their impact and leave a legacy that matters, which I love. Um, she's the author of a fabulous book, hold it up for us, Denise, Ready to Be a Thought Leader, which I highly, highly recommend if you have any, any desires to get out there and be speaking more and to get more visibility for your ideas and to have more impact. It's a great, almost how-to guide, in my opinion, of what you need to do to make that happen. She's taught thought leadership at the Stanford School of Business, and she re uh, previously she co-founded a trade organization and the first venture capital conference for women entrepreneurs, known as Springboard, which has helped women raise over $8 billion for their companies. Denise has been honored as one of the champions of change by the White House. And um, just a fun way of describing what Denise does is she's a thought leader about thought leadership. So welcome, Denise. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks. Happy to be here. It's nice to see you. Great. So uh, let's just jump right into this conversation. Um, uh, as many of you know, empathy is a topic near and dear to my heart. My book, The Empathy Edge, will be coming out this fall. Um, and if you're viewing this later, it's already out. Um, but I did a lot of research in that book, and Denise can probably attest to this too with her work with leaders, is that it's not just a theory. It's actually, there's research and data behind the fact that empathy is a leadership advantage. Um, some of the benefits that I pointed out in my book were increased loyalty, um, increased productivity, better ability to reach your goals, um, and better retention of your top talent. But empathy as a leader is, is such an important skill to cultivate. And some of us might think we're not as empathetic as we'd like to be, um, the beauty of my book is that I actually talk about ways that you can flex your empathy muscle. But I wanted to talk from Denise's point of view, working with thought leaders. Um, you've worked with so many top executives, um, people who have far exceeded their goal, far succeeded their goals in their fields. And I kind of have a two-part question for you. Number one, do you see empathy as a common trait among some of these people? And number two, how have you seen them? act on that empathy in order to get to success? It's wonderful to sort of think about it as, as a leadership trait because I don't think it's a conversation we have very often. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's so many things. You have to be a big visionary. You have to be, you know, you have to execute if all of your detailed uh, tactics, et cetera. But, but to me, this is the piece about the middle, right? So I think of, of leadership as vision, relationships, execution. And if you don't have this empathy gene, this relationship piece often falls apart because you can, I think, for a short amount of time, do transactional relationships relationships, you know, quid pro quo, I'll do a little for you, you'll do a little for me. But over time, that, that doesn't, isn't very sustainable. I mean, over time, that either gets in disequilibrium or there's some resentment that builds up. But if you end up building an actual relationship, a connection with someone else, I think that takes empathy. It takes, takes an ability to step in someone else's shoes. And, and I think thought leadership all the more so, right? If you're really going to be bringing people over to a new idea, if you're going to get people to think and act differently, you can't do this just by pushing new information at them. I mean, when was the last time any of this changed our mind because of new facts right. or new data or whatever, or that I tried to push you to do something? No, it's it's really, honestly, it's about stepping into that other person's experience and, and seeing things through their eyes. Yeah, and I think that's really what we're talking about here is that mindset of, of not only trying to get that what they call the perspective taking but also like you said if you're trying to influence or change people's minds about something um, change the way that they're doing something and to really be innovative 
empathy is so important because you've got to meet people where they are. And unless you're being empathetic to understanding where they are, then it's just you just like blaring this, this bullhorn at them and seeing what will stick. Um, as you were talking, you know, what really sprung to mind to me and, and a story that I included in the book was about Satya Nadella at Microsoft. And he writes a lot about the fact that empathy is an underused leadership skill. And he feels that it's one of his most important skills um, as evidenced by the, the change in culture at Microsoft since he took over. I mean, my husband worked there for uh, a, while, a few years and, you know, it almost killed him <laughs> under the old regime. But, you know, he even says, you know, I, that place is a totally different place from when I worked there. And um, I, a lot of that has to do with that leadership style of empathy and of, of even if you're, you're making a decision that people don't like, it's how can you do it in a way that, again, meets them where they are. And they might not like that decision, but, but they'll go along with it a little bit better because you're considering their point of view and you're maybe delivering it in a way that they can best consume it. Yeah, there's sort of two things that, that reminds me of. First is this idea that we learn from writing an op-ed, which I think is a common thought leadership uh, thing to try to do, to bring people around to. There is a, there is a part of writing an op-ed that's the, what they call the to be sure. So that you're writing around, you know, you're saying, here's why you should believe this. But if you don't go back with a to be sure paragraph and, and bring it back to where people are today, to be sure you may believe this, or to be sure up until now many people have believed this, you're not going to get people to change their mind. They, you, we need to feel respected, we need to feel understood, we need to feel heard for where we are today before we're willing to be open-minded to what, what else is out there, like maybe my perspective is wrong, but if you're gonna tell me I'm stupid, or I'm wrong, or you know, only fools believe X, <laughs> Guess what? Not a lot of people are going to come around to, right? Um, and then I loved your example of Satya because you know, he was one of the very first. I speak at a big uh, global conference on for women in technology called the Grace Hopper Conference. You probably know of it. Mm -hmm. And you know, 10,000, 11,000 women come to this conference every year, and they've had 98% women speakers over many, many, many years. And this, wow. a couple of years ago, they decided, okay, you know, we need, we need to be talking to men, obviously. We need to be hearing from men. And so Satya was one of the first people that they invited to be on the stage. And, and here's what was so interesting. He made a very big, you know, what anybody might call a faux pas while he was up there. He, somebody asked him the question, you know, do you think people, women, should step forward and ask for a promotion? And he said, no, I think they should wait that it will come to them. That's been my experience. And the room erupted into, you know, you can imagine his, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> well, he really pretty much instantly realized he'd made a mistake. And what was great about it was that he didn't just sort of, you know, do the, oh, well, that's just my opinion kind of thing, which a lot of people will do, which to me is a not empathetic answer. Mm -hmm. Instead, he actually really reflected. And the next day, he sat down with his team. He really came up with a much more me measured response. He wrote a letter. And it wasn't like a letter of apology. It was a letter of, okay, I didn't get it. I understand now that my perspective is a very privileged perspective and, you know, my career maybe did have pattern that way, but yours is not likely to. And so you need to adopt these kinds of traits. And I thought, you know, good for you. I'm not saying that you may, when we make a faux pas that we immediately throw ourselves on our sword and, oh, that's going to show empathy. No, what shows empathy is that you go and you get the facts on the ground. You go get the understanding of the people who you're talking to, even if it's a little later. And then you, you, cat, you um, modify what you, your thinking is in a way that in that case was very public mm -hmm. and I recognize that, okay, I didn't get it before. I wasn't in your world. Now I'm trying to be, and here's what I've learned might be a better strategy. And I thought, you go. That, right, right. That's an leader. Well, and also, you know, that's a big point I made in the book was that this, this idea of empathy is not about just giving people what they want. It's not about kowtowing. I mean, that's, that's submission. That's not empathy, right? Good point. But empathy relies on taking those perspectives. Maybe, maybe that does shape your decision or that's input for your decision. But like I said, in the end, you might have to say something people disagree with. But if you can do it in a way where it's like, okay, you've been heard. And yes. after reflection, I've thought about that. I still might feel this way or I still might make this decision. But here's what we can do to work together or to alleviate that for you or whatever it is. But so I think people look at it so binary of yes. 
you know, I'm going to show no soft skills as a leader because that's going to show that I'm weak and I can't make decisions and, you know, and, or it's like, I'm going to, I'm going to just acquiesce to every crazy demand that I'm getting from a customer or from a, a team member or a colleague or a subordinate. And there's, there's a happy medium of, to me, it's almost as, and I've, as I've been researching the book, this is what's been coming out. It's almost a mindset of, of acquiring information. It's sort of how people take in the information to make the end decision that they make. That's the difference. It, it could end up being the exact same decision that someone who's not empathetic makes, but people are, are more comfortable with it because they know that their, their input has been considered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I think you're right. It is a little more messy. You know, it's nice mm -hmm. to have that straight line. I'm just going to stick on my path with nothing that's going to get in my way. Right. You know, realistically, it's, it ties, I think, very much to Carol Dweck's work on the growth mindset. Like, do yes. I believe that there's always more to learn? Do I believe that there's more skills and I can change my attitude and my behaviors and I'm going to continue to develop as a leader? And I think that is what we all want. We all want, and this is what I think breaks down a lot in politics, that, that we want somebody, what we say that they've changed their mind, they must have flip-flopped, which is extremely dangerous because, right. of course, we want leaders to mature. We want leaders to take in new information, mm -hmm. whether they're political leaders leaders or leaders of organizations of any kind, we want them to be willing to understand newly, new information, new perspectives, new ideas, and consider them. And, you know, sometimes you'll change, sometimes you won't. But mm -hmm. if you're not even listening and you're still stuck in where you were when you were 25, I, I don't know if you should be leading my organization. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. I, don't know. I, don't want, I want that 25-year-old leading my organization. I don't know. Oh, I don't think so. So to your wheelhouse, I mean, when we, well, first for a second, let's just quickly define thought leadership as you're talking about it here. And then I want to talk about the role of empathy in thought leadership. So, so how do you define thought leadership? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. And there's, so there are a very couple of simple answers. And then of course there's a more complex. The simple answer is one definition I like is that it's thought leadership is about being able to change the way people think or the way people act. That's a sort of a simple definition. Another thing I think about is that leadership is often a one to many. You're trying to communicate an idea, a change, whatever, from one to many. Thought leadership is many to many. You're trying to galvanize people to pick up these ideas and carry them forward. So you know, I think about it, the idea of creating a movement. It isn't just getting a few people on board. It's getting all of those people willing to speak up and speak out and, and argue for an idea that's much bigger to others in their community. And I think over time, you see, you know, change happens in, in concentric circles. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I mean, and that's kind of with my book, I'm trying to create an empathy army where let's flip the script on what it means to be successful. Let's, let's have an appreciation that compassion and cash flow can coexist, that leadership and kindness can coexist, and that competitiveness and empathy can coexist. Because I think a lot of people don't, see it that way. They see it as a zero sum game or whatever the expression is about the polar opposites. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I kind of conclude the book with this idea of like, I hope when my son grows up, they don't need books like this anymore. Mm -hmm. Like that's that it becomes such a part of who we are and how we operate. And, you know, the hopeful part is, is a lot of the research I did on what people are doing with young people and what they're doing in schools and what some social entrepreneurs are doing, what they're doing in preschools where they're trying to create this generation of leaders and thought leaders that just, this is their MO. This is how they, they operate. So, um, so your, your point about empathy being a necessary ingredient in, in thought leadership, does that go back to what you were saying earlier about if you're trying to ignite a spark, if you're trying to change the way people think, is it about delivering the message or is it about shaping the message itself where empathy is required? It's a plus and. It's a plus and. You know, I go, I, the, one of the books I love most about change is uh, Dan and Chip Heath's book called Switch. I love and, that book. I love the book, right? It's just so <laughs> brilliant. But what they say in that book, and you know, the subtitles, I think it's what, How to Make Change When Change is Hard, which is, so it kind of sums it up. But this is, thought leaders' work is about making change in the world. Mm -hmm. So what they talk about is both the rider and the elephant. You know, there's one side of our brain that is lazy, that the elephant that just wants to sit on the couch doesn't really want to ever 
think newly or change anything. And the other side is kind of the writer, like wants is eager to, to go forward. And you have to talk to both sides. And so I think right. as, as thought leaders and change agents, yes, we need to shape and crisply articulate a message. But the other half of articulating a message is always thinking what's in it for them. Like this isn't about just, you know, I'm the sage from the stage and I'm going to tell you, I'm here from on high, I'm here to tell you the way. And mm -hmm. honestly, just hello, kind of maybe that <laughs> works in religion, but it doesn't really work in everyday business. And so right. maybe we need to be thinking instead about, okay, what is the, what is the conversation that is about them? What is it that makes them, why should they come on board with this new person? Right. Why should they sit up and take notice? Exactly. And that's why I love what you're saying because... That's the ingredient that so many companies miss, especially in my brand work, where they say, like, we want, to, we want to develop a thought leadership strategy where we're putting our CEO on the stage and they're talking about these big ideas. And, and it's like, but to what end? Just to get exposure for the company? That's not, that's not thought leadership. But if you have a perspective on how things should be done or what changes we want to be seen, now you can have a conversation about building a brand around thought leadership. It's not yeah. just about... Oh, thought, you know, pursuing a thought leadership strategy means getting me on every stage at every conference. And that means to me, that's just marketing. I think yeah, exactly. Really conflated these two things together, brand building, content marketing, and, and, uh, you know, getting out as a speaker, that is one part of the world. Okay. But the piece about this to, that I articulate is that it is about being a change agent for, I hope to, you know, to bend the arc of justice, our arc of the world towards justice, you know, that to me is being a real change agent and a real thought leader. And, and the thought leadership is also about walking your talk. You can't just go around telling everybody, you should do this. When my own company, you know, we, let's say you're a CEO of a company and you're saying the world should be, uh, we should treat our employees better. Meanwhile, you're laying off 5,000 people without a severance. You know, these kinds of disconnects, which we hear sadly in a market where people are not empathetically leaders. Exactly. Exactly. And that's what, you know, especially with the book, you know, I talk about it from an individual level and a culture level, because you, if you don't have those two inner rings of the circle, the external we're perceived as an empathetic brand has nothing to be based on. Yeah. Because you you're not actually walking your talk. hole right through that in a minute. Exactly. And that's where you get the like, Oh, we want to be seen as empathetic. Let's give a whack load of money to charity. That'll make people think we're empathetic or, you know, so that's part of it. That's one tactic of doing good in the community, but it has to come from a genuine place. So yeah. I and love I that. I talk a lot about the different you know, companies like Chobani, where you not only have a CEO who is in action to hire refugees, and he himself is a refugee, but mm -hmm. also started this organization called the Tent Foundation and brought 80 companies together to do similar action. So it's, it is about taking action in a way that isn't, just for you and your own company and selling right. more yogurt. It is about, okay, are we going to do something in our communities, especially around an issue where taking a stand as a thought leader is, is the core element. You know, you have to have a point of view. You have to take a stand about something. And it is extremely challenging for many organizations because all they think about is the risks. And so they, they think, okay, the only way to justify this is if I can see that it's going to give me an ROI. Right. Well, my ROI is not about dollars. My ROI is about trust. To me, thought leadership in, and honestly, empathy is all about building trust. We are, that is the connection point that we need for any organization to want to do business with them, no matter mm -hmm. if it's a you know, small, medium, large, whether it's for-profit, non-profit, you need to trust the leaders, you need to trust the entity as, as acting in good faith in the world, and all of this is tied to that. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a tangent from on that because I want to I want to just talk to you for, and get your opinion about thought leadership. Do you think are there people who shouldn't be thought leaders? I guess, I guess so. If there's an executive out there that wants to pursue a thought leadership strategy to get more exposure for the company, but they actually don't have a point of view or a perspective or an, or an approach that's trying to change something, does that mean you say that's then you're really not trying to be a thought leader. You're trying to be something else. Well, I think you're trying to be a visible expert at that point. And I think okay. it's absolutely appropriate for people to be visible experts. You know, mm -hmm. people, academics have done this for generations. Mm -hmm. We're not to say that there's something wrong with that, but it isn't thought leadership. And again, I'm trying to, maybe I'm just trying to hold on to this term for dear life and, and <laughs> reclaim it from being, you know, it's all things to everybody. And it's right. To, 
none of those things. It is a very particular perspective and it is about having a point of view. It is about building a particular kind of culture. It is about building an engaged ecosystem around big ideas and visible experts are very useful in that, that, but they are not honestly about anything but themselves most of the time. And that is, I I don't want to go, that's a little too far. I don't want to go. Right, right. But I do think that that is a different piece. And being a visible Mm -hmm. expert is a worthy goal for many. And that is not thought leadership. I'm going to start using that with my brand clients because I think we we even conflate the terms. And I, I need to talk to them about, are you actually wanting to be a thought leader or just a visible expert, because that's okay too. So I love that. Totally okay, yeah. Um, so how do you think when you're working with some leaders that might not feel like they have that empathy gene, even though I've presented research in the book that we are all innately empathetic as human beings, some of us just haven't flexed the muscle as much as others, right? So when you work with thought leaders or coach them, what are some things that you think leaders can look to to build up empathy? For themselves. Yeah, so much of this is design thinking skills. It is about being willing to get out and listen and actually be with whoever it is you're trying to influence. So are you standing on behalf of young women leaders in your community? Do you know any young women leaders in your community? Have you actually talked with them? Are you standing for refugees? When was the last time you had dinner with a refugee, you know, and go to mm-hmm. their world where they are living? I think that is to me the critical piece that the design thinking element of life is about getting into your audience's world, whoever that is you're trying to influence. And it's also, of course, true, you know, when you're trying to work with a CXO, when was the last time you sat down with some CXOs and talked to them about what they're really struggling with? This is a, I can't serve you if I don't know what your world is. Like, what is it that, I hate that question, you know, what keeps you up at night, but it's a really, it's a really valid question. Right. And having those kinds of conversations on a more regular basis. And then I think the second is to listen listen with a full heart uh, to others in your space. So this isn't about, oh, these are my competitors and I've got to listen to what they say so I can counter them. That to me is not, that's not helpful either. We're usually in my world of thought leadership, we're all trying to move towards some big change in the world. You know, for me, my work was always about how can we increase the amount of venture capital going to women entrepreneurs? And it turns out, you know, I'm one not, I was running one trade association, one venture capital conference. It turns out there's thousands of people working on this issue of women's access to capital, whether it's credit, whether it's equity, whether it's whatever. And once I started to listen with an open heart to all of these people and what, how they were approaching it and really seeing this whole ecosystem of people who are working towards something and trying to connect with them and share messages with them and, and, you know, amplify what they're doing. That to me is also an effort that a thought leader should be taking and can be taking. Get outside of your own look at me piece and look at what the whole world is, the whole ecosystem is doing to move this world forward. Because only together does any change really happen. That's so true. Well, I, uh, I would like to leave it at that because I think that that's a great um, summation of what we're talking about. So tell people how they can learn more about you and engage with more of your work around thought leadership, whether they are looking to become thought leaders themselves or they're looking to maybe even be part of organizations that are nurturing future thought leaders. Sure. So two, two ways. Uh, the, well, maybe three. The first, of course, Buy the book. Buy the book. It's really good. <laughs> it really is what you said. It is a how-to guide. I wrote it to my younger self when I was uh, stepping into being a what I call an accidental thought leader. I wrote this book years later to that younger me. Oh, I love that. Had this book because I, I really needed it back then. So I did write a how-to guide. Second is uh, I have an online course on LinkedIn learning. So for people who are premium members of LinkedIn, there's a course called Becoming a Thought Leader. And it's an online course. It's about an hour and a half. And it's uh, in video and so I think it's pretty good it's getting a lot of views around the world and then third is my website uh, thoughtleadershiplab.com great and I will include all those links in the video below in the show notes but thank you so much for your time today Denise we really appreciate it it was great to talk with you